So this morning I'd like to move on from the look at the apostles that we've been looking at for probably three or so months now. And I wanted to find something that was a little more uh, maybe relatable to the ordinance and came across the story of Lazarus again. We all know that story. I preached on it in the past. Uh, you probably have heard dozens or more of messages on it uh, in your time in the church as well. But there's what I love about the stories are so much in there and there's a different aspect or detail that always seems to pop out even when I read it. So um, I'd like to uh, get to the scripture at this time and read at least the beginning part leading up to it uh, because it is a long, uh, a long portion of scripture. It's found in John chapter 11 and I want to begin in verse 17. It says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where had you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And so I'll end the reading there. I ask the Lord's blessing on the reading and hearing of his holy word. But we know what happened after that. We know that Jesus raised him from the dead. And there's so much we could say about that too. But I wanted to stop it there too. Because the part that I read is I think the part that most of us can relate to. We've had disappointments, we've had loss, we've had struggles and trials in our lives. And I think we can know exactly what Martha and Mary were dealing with. Martha and Mary are two different women. They are sisters, but they're different individuals. And so they respond differently too. Um, one of them seems to be a little more intellectual in nature. The other one seems to be a little more emotional in nature. It's not that one is right and one's wrong. Right, right and one's wrong. It's that they're just wired differently. I myself tend to look at things from more of an intellectual uh, standpoint. And as I've tried to grow in my faith and in Christ, I've tried to uh, explore that emotional side as well. And it has been eye-opening to me too. And so all of us though, it's not like you're, you have to be one or the other, all intellectual or all emotional. Uh, we're a mixture. And that mixture changes with the times and with the circumstances as well. And so Mary and Martha, they felt emotions. And what I notice here, they didn't hide their disappointment in Jesus. Now, is that a sin to be disappointed at Jesus? I don't think it is. I think the Bible would have told us specifically that there was a serious problem with their results. They were disappointed, but it did not come at the expense of their faith. They still maintained their faith. And how often in life do we say, God, 
I don't know why you allowed this to happen. I'm disappointed that this happened. Maybe even disappointed in you, God, but I still trust you. And that's what we see here in Mary and Martha. Uh, the, one, the one sister, Jesus was able to have more of a theological discussion with her. He talks about the resurrection and what the scriptures say about that. And he corrected uh, one of her uh, misconceptions. Yeah, I know Lazarus is going to be raised in the end. And Jesus says, no, no, it's happening now. It is in me and who I am. Whereas the other sister, he, Jesus could see she was so distraught. She was at home. She didn't even hear that discussion. And so sometimes when we're going through those things, it's not always best to shove a Bible in someone's face. Here's the Bible study. This is what God says. So, you know, everything's going to be well in the end. Sometimes it's not very comforting. It's not, it might be true, but it's not always very helpful. And so you have so many different details that are coming together in this passage. And Jesus engages each of these sisters as separate individual women, which is what they are. And that's what I hope we remember as we minister to others in every single day of our lives. If you're, you know, you come, you go into the, to work one day and you find out that maybe um, one of your co-workers uh, has a child who uh, just got a serious diagnosis and now they have to go to all these doctor appointments and all that, you know, do, do they in the moment need the Bible? Well, I guess technically they do, but in the moment, they need love from someone. They need comfort first. And then you can share about how good God is and they can see God work in the events that pass. So every situation is different though. And again, knowing what you know about your coworkers or your family members or whoever they are, it's not a one size fits all thing as to how we minister to people because people will respond to different methods in different ways. This here is, I think, a really good lesson for us because sometimes we, we learn as much from the Bible about what characters don't say as to what they do say. Again, Martha, you know, she was more uh, theologically, um, you know, uh, uh, Jesus was able to share more theology with her, more emotion with the other sister too. And sometimes if you've been there, and we all have been at some point in our lives, Sometimes we're feeling down in the dumps, we're feeling blue, we feel depressed, whatever word we want to give to it. And sometimes we just need encouragement and we need someone to come uh, and meet us in that emotional realm. And then another time we might need someone to share with us the intellectual uh, goodness of God as well. And to know that he does love us and he does have a plan for everything that happens. And What's a really significant verse is verse 33 here. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Um, we do our best, scholars, I should say, do their best when they translate from the original language. This is a tough one, and so most of your Bibles will say something similar to that, deeply moved in spirit. But to me, that's sort of vague. Uh, you really need some kind of an expression that brings together sadness and anger together. That's what Jesus was feeling. That's what you get in the original language. That's probably lost a bit in our English translation. And so we might ask, why is Jesus angry? We know that he's sad. You know, he's certainly not angry at the sisters, they didn't do anything wrong. They're the ones who are mourning and weeping. I think it's pretty clear that Jesus is angry at sin. He's angry at death. Again, he became one of us. And so he got to see what we deal with. 
Uh, many scholars suggest that Joseph, Jesus' father, uh, most likely passed away during his lifetime. Uh, otherwise, you, it's a little bit of an argument from, uh, from uh, um, you know, with him not being there. But anyway, Jesus certainly experienced the loss of people that he loved. And Lazarus was a close friend, too. Here he sees how he feels Jesus himself cried. And he cried, I'm sure, for his own loss. He cried for the loss of Mary and Martha. And here's the thing. Jesus cried when Lazarus died, knowing that he was going to raise him four days later. What does that tell us about Jesus? That he wants to meet us in our situation and in our context where we are. And so that's what Jesus did when he asked where Lazarus's grave is. He went there and he wept because he knows how terrible death is. He knows how terrible sin is. If not for sin, we wouldn't have death. And again, he, he cried knowing he would raise Lazarus. He also cried knowing that we'll all be raised, like Jesus, like the sister said. Uh, she knew that we'd all be resurrected on the last day too. And so that tells me that our tears cause God to cry as well. And that only, could only happen if he loved us, and he does. Being saved, knowing Jesus and following him, doesn't ever shelter us from the effects of sin. I um, think we understand that very clearly. And so that means we're going to have difficult times. We're going to deal with loss and pain and trouble and so forth. But I hope this serves as a reminder of some of the things that we already know in a sense. Maybe we haven't thought of them in terms like this, but God created us to be intellectual creatures so that we can learn. But he also created us to be emotional creatures too, that we have feelings and we feel the highs and the lows and everything in between. And since God became one of us in Jesus, he became a man who had a friendship with Lazarus. And he's a man who ministered to Lazarus's sisters after the death of her brother, their brother. And he did so both intellectually and emotionally matching the, uh, the character of each of the sisters. And we, can, we could get into all these details. Uh, there's so many more, you know, how Jesus intentionally hung back and uh, waited until, uh, you know, four days had passed. Uh, part of that reason is not described in the Bible, but part of that reason is that there was some kind of a... Uh, idea floating around in sort of pagan religions that said that a person's uh, spirit would hover over the body for three days after and then if they uh, and then after after the fourth day it would leave so that makes a little more sense why jesus waited the fourth day that way people attributed the resurrection of lazarus to jesus and not just some spiritual realm thing going on Things like that I'm constantly uncovering and uh, just uh, boggles my mind, blows my mind, and it just shows me even more of the goodness of God. And so we can be assured that God understands who we are. And a big part of the reason is because he became one of us. He had a son and he sent him here to be with us. And we know the story of Jesus, how he lived the perfect life, he died a death that he should not, have, that was not deserved, so that he could be raised again, and he is alive today. That's what we are going to celebrate momentarily after this brief message is over. We're going to celebrate the body and the blood of Jesus, which is for the forgiveness of sins. And I know that sometimes 
people I know that all the time, we, we come from different, different backgrounds. We come from different areas and different, we all experience, had different experiences this past week. Well, we come together though, if nothing else, united in Jesus Christ and in our faith in him. That's what this day is about. And there are times when we feel alone, depressed, discouraged, and all the rest. And so we need to be reminded of God's great love. This here is a perfect reminder of that. Those of you who are parents or grandparents, and you don't have to give a show of hands because I know not a single one would come up, who would give your child away willingly for someone else who didn't appreciate it? And my hand would not be up either. Yet that's what God did. He gave us Jesus Christ so that all that we have to do is believe in him and put our faith in him and manifest that faith in following him. Then we would know that we could be with God forever. And that's where the church comes in. That's where we come alongside each other as well. And we help each other along the way. And we can uh, be there and minister to other during our time of need. And so you have this, as I try to wrap this up, close it out, the intellectual side and the emotional side, they're two sides of the same coin. And sometimes we emphasize one, sometimes we emphasize the other. But I think they come together perfectly in the Lord's Supper as we understand intellectually the sacrifice that Jesus made, we read it in scriptures, we see how it was the fulfillment of the Old Testament and everything in the temple and things like that. And yet there's also the emotion that just should naturally come through when you consider that God gave his son for you, that when he was agonizing in pain up on that cross, each one of us were on his mind. Everyone who came before us was on his mind as well. And when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that so that we didn't have to. And so I pray that uh, that uh, inspires and encourages us this day, no matter what we're dealing with, if we are having a good day, it's been a great week, and I hope that this coming week is even better, well, that prepares us so that we can minister to those who aren't feeling that way. And if you're on the other end of it, and things just don't seem to be going right every time you turn around, something's going wrong, then you also know that we are the creatures that God created us to be intellectually and emotionally, and there's no shame in taking comfort from other people as well. But regardless, we know that God is always there with us, holding our hands through the good days and the bad. And so I just want to close with words, paraphrase words of Job. When he lost virtually everything early in that book, he said, shall we not accept good from God and also the bad. That is the Christian life, and that's the journey that we're all on together. Let us bow our heads and go to the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us in the way that you did. We are intellectual and rational creatures on one hand. We're also emotional on the other hand. We laugh, we cry, we do all sorts of different things. And uh, your son Jesus did those same things because he was one of us. He was a man like us. And we can't thank you enough for the sacrifice that he made. But God, we just ask that you would prepare our hearts at this time for the Lord's Supper. This is, this is something that Jesus established a long time ago, something that he commanded for his followers to do. And we don't want to ever approach it in a cavalier or flippant manner because this is very significant and very important. And so, God, we just ask for your guidance and your presence in the moments that follow as we prepare the elements and we go through the ritual, but we don't want it to be a ritual in a very crass sense where it just is, we go through the motions. 
we want you to prepare our hearts so that this means something to us and this is the most significant thing that we will do not only all day but certainly all month definitely and even longer than that so we thank you and praise you in jesus holy name amen <laughs>